Hello, everybody, and welcome in to the 138th episode of the Penny Bloom Podcast. His I, Colton Robertson, and I today am welcoming back for the first time in weeks, Kyler Barnett. What's up, homie? Oh, not much, man. I'm, I've been very busy lately, a whole lot of work, school, and baseball going on, so just trying to balance and juggle all that. Unfortunately, I've had to uh, let the uh, let the squad fall on the back burner a little bit, but it's definitely good to be back. Glad, you know, opening in and, and seeing that look when I came in, I finally was in, Colton jumped right up, he's ready to go. Now, hey, right. here we are back in action, feels just like good times. Yeah, it feels just it feels just like old times. Old times on, being about right four or five habits. weeks ago, but uh, uh, I'm excited. I I wanted uh, your first episode back, whenever that may have been, to be about the many saints of Newark. Uh, came out a couple weeks ago. Me and you both finished The Sopranos in anticipation of the uh, many saints. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I'm very excited to talk with you today about that and we'll get to that after the theme song you hear in a bit but uh any other entertainment you've been taking in recently what's up man it's been tough because i haven't been out i i wanted to go see shane she with my girlfriend and we haven't really got a chance she's out in topeka so i haven't really gotten a chance so i still need to catch up with shane chi Damn. Um, I'm, I'm lagging a little behind, but I need to catch up. Uh, I did go see Venom Let There Be Carnage with some friends a few weeks ago. Good shit, um, good shit. Yeah, I mean, I, I like Venom Let There Be Carnage. I mean, hey, people are going to have their naysays, and that's fine. It may not be, you know, it's not the apex of film. There's no bones about it, but no, shit, but it's, it's a fun it's, movie to watch. Man. It's Venom, yeah. It's yeah. Venom, fuck it, man. I don't it's think fun. that should that's be all. the standard. I think we need to stop saying that. I agree with you, and I, um, I think that overall, in terms of comic book media, that needs to sort of be the attitude. Yeah, uh, you don't hold because uh, like standard with with the Batman trailer dropping last week and stuff. I've seen a lot of discourse about how it's exciting for a superhero film to finally look like an actual movie. See, uh, I think the issue is is like the further back in time we go, like the less like. I think there's just a gap because, like, when we do the MCU stuff, that shit's so futuristic and so out there that people are really easy and quick to dismiss that, like, oh, well, based in reality, obviously not. And so, like, it's just, like, one of those things where it's like, well, these are supposed to be, like, superheroes. The whole concept itself is a little ridiculous. Like, we gotta yeah, – that's the whole point. You're supposed to feel like you're not watching – you know, like, this is supposed to be something – Exactly. And, it's and, supposed and here's to the be. thing. And here's the thing is that when it comes to the MCU in comparison to like the Batman with Robert Pattinson or Joker with Joaquin Phoenix and gritty gritty comic book films like that, they aren't at all trying to be that. Like that's just no. not at all what the goal is. Like so like whenever I think I guess more than anything what gets people riled up to say the MCU movies aren't as good as they think they are is also on Marvel fans. It's like, hey, you also got to recognize these movies aren't God. They're they're yeah, fun. Well, I think that's the problem is Marvel fans want to confuse like, oh, I love this like category of movies and I love the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Therefore, they are the apex of film. No, no, no. Hold on. Th th those no, two are not the same. Not that the just best. means that's your favorite. That's your favorite. Yeah. And that's fine. Because guess what? You know what's it's great about having a favorite? Lot. It's subjective, and there's no one anyone can say to discount it because it's you. Exactly. If they want to judge you for it, I mean, hey, that's their prerogative, but I think that there needs to be less of that. But if that, you know, if that's your favorite, that's your favorite. No one can discount that. Exactly. And I'm with you. That's <laughs> why That's why whenever folks get mad and want to say that, like, Infinity War is, like, the best, like, critically the best film of the 2010s. Yeah, it's not. I'm like, it's not. But I it's think good. you can talk about it on a, like, you can talk about its importance and relevance because of how huge it was. That, that has magnitude. But just because it had that doesn't make it the like the best film in all t of all time or a critically incredible, perfect, seamless film I'm that you know. You. So I just think that's the uh, there's a logjam definitely. I think you know Marvel fans definitely rush to bat, and uh, I think they tend to misconstrue the real point they want to make, which is like this is something that I resonate and fucking love more than like a lot of other things, and that's fine. 
but that just doesn't make it the best of any like nah, yeah, there's a reason Martin it's not Scorsese the best of film, yeah. Yeah, there's a reason Martin Scorsese recognizes it as it is. I do think it is funny. It is funny now that like uh Dennis Villanueva and stuff like this. You got a new movie coming out. Hey, you should trash Marvel a little bit. Because it's going to create hype for your movie. Yep, yep. It, like, people are going to well, talk about your movie. This goes back to the age old of that, you know, there's no such thing as bad press. You hop on the coattails of a name like Marvel and you say something a little uh, that'll rile up a big fan base. I mean, Marvel's a huge fan base, no secret. So you yeah, say something you say, like that, you say, like, you're going to generate no some loss. buzz. Yeah, you're there's gonna no be... loss here for Dennis Villanueva yeah. saying shit, like, because he's got Dune coming out. Yeah. Therefore, Everyone who's like, you know what? He's right. This will be better than any Marvel movie. We'll go see it. And the people who are going to be like, no, there's no way. We'll probably still go see it and because, then say it's bad. But guess what? Money's already in the bank. Money's in his pocket. Money's in the Money's bank. Money's in his pocket. It, it already happened. You played just It that. already happened. It already happened. I And uh, speaking of, uh, you know, movies making money and such. Uh, the Many Saints in Newark. I uh, I really want to go and sit down in a theater and watch this. I have not gotten a chance to yeah. do so. Uh, however, David Chase has voiced how much he really, really was disappointed with the fact that this also went to HBO Max. So it makes me feel guilty having watched it on HBO yeah. Max twice. Uh, but uh, I I really I really want to support the creator and go right. catch it. In, well, in, and in, I think with I think with Chase is like. I think this was probably one of his first big chances, like, to put this set of characters in this, you know, I mean, The Sopranos was his, you know, that's his masterpiece, essentially, so, like, I think when he finally got a chance to make the movie, he's like, hey, I get to put this in a movie theater, this film was made in that light, you know, made Mm -hmm. for film, made for cinema, so, yeah, I see what you're saying. I hadn't thought about it like that. Now I do have a little bit of guilt. I probably need to no, no. see well, uh, and, uh, the experience is a little different. Whenever that happens, I uh, I would like I, – I, I just need to make it happen. However, let's roll into the theme song, and then we'll get going with the Many Saints conversation. You ready? To the Penny Bloom Podcast. Ain't another place that has got more bomb bass. Rump past your mom, dad's listening to Tom Cats. Talking everything that make you sad. We don't want that. We're here to make you smile. Put your mind at ease. Peace, love, and bloom. And always praise Keanu Reeves. This what we about. Get some weed and now. We'll talk until we can't no more. And then we peace and out. Alright, let's go. Penny Bloom Podcast. It's the Penny Bloom Podcast. Penny Bloom Podcast. It's the Bloom podcast. Penny, Penny Bloom podcast. Penny, Penny, Penny Bloom podcast. Penny Bloom. So we've got the many saints of Newark. I I finished The Sopranos. It took me a year. It, it took me over a year to watch The Sopranos. I I started it. I think August 2020, September 2020. Finished it September 2021. I took some fat breaks, not not because the show was bad. Yeah, it's well, a lot. I think with that show is that's like you said, it's a lot, and I think it's a show that taking breaks can make sense. Like I think, especially when you think about you know the time that passes between seasons is never congruent. It's never the same. You know, you're not following a traditional time of like, oh, each season takes over the course of you know one year of you know time in the life of these characters and. And then when we come back, it's, oh, it's, it's, you know, a season later, it's summer now, instead of being, you know, we left off in the spring or whatever. It isn't like that where it's totally seamless, you know, it it takes some leaps from season to season occasionally, and it's never the same. So I feel like it's a show that when you take breaks, it's not, you know, that detrimental. And I think, you know, in the course of a season, each episode, I watched a video the other day, and it hit it really good on the head about how the show is kind of structured in a sense and it, it's where it's it's not each season is like following you know each episode builds off of the last one to move towards this one big thing happening at the end of the season it's like it isn't going to be a straight line the way david chase and the way sopranos kind of rolled with him through seasons is 
it's like, oh, we're going to have this one event. And then a couple episodes later, it may not be all that relevant. But all of a sudden, at the end of the year, you see what that first episode had that led to what, you know, what a climax of a season looks like in Sopranos. Everybody knows, you know, kind of that feeling and that vibe of a sit finale is it's like there's a lot of anxiety in that finale every season. I felt like is because it's like. It's so unpredictable because it isn't like like I just said, it's not that straight line where like, oh, hey, now I for sure know what's coming like to a degree we've been building to it because it's like it wasn't a straight line there. We had some no. things that kind of like diverged. No, they throw you off. The yeah. Well, and this movie's a good example. I want to start spoiler free for a while uh, to a Fair degree enough. just to let let people yeah, yeah, let yeah, people yeah. get that acclimated. Way we can get, some, get some people listening that maybe haven't seen it yet. Yeah, but just like uh just like the show, there's there's a very there's there's very big parts of this movie where they just go you were led to believe one thing, psych. Not at all. Uh and I like that. I love that from the Sopranos and th- that's why this this movie also felt it, it felt so akin to the series. Like, like it, yeah. it really was. No, it was definitely felt like people. a love letter to the series. I mean, like, David Chase definitely wasn't, like, coy about making this movie in a sense of, like, he was going to be true to the roots, you know? He was going to make sure that this show still felt Sopranos y. You know what I mean? It felt like what the show felt like. But it's and just we, an and we even saw. Yeah, and we even saw some familiar faces. Oh, yeah. We got, uh, that, that was one of my favorite parts well, of the movie. I like, I like not only just the faces, but there's just some references in there where, like, if you watch the show, you know, that's a definite, like, nod to you. Like, hey, kudos. He doesn't David have, Chase is like, kudos, he doesn't man. have the makings of a varsity athlete. <laughs> that, and then, uh, they mentioned the bookie, Tony's first kill. They mentioned the bookie, and I believe, I, I feel like that was the name. Cause, uh, shoot, what's that? But um, I'm almost positive that's what it was from. Yeah, yeah. Will, Willie Overall, the bookie. That was Tony's first body, the one in the show where we see uh, at towards the end of the show we see Tony have to go dig him up because the feds raided the house where the body had been buried. So it was just kind of cool nods right. like that. Man, shit like that. that's just uh, yeah. I didn't even catch that one. I didn't even catch that one. But like, there's also the uh uh. The, from Polly to Tony, at one point he mentions the rash, uh-huh. which they that that was just an ongoing joke that still hasn't been explained. wasn't explained in this wasn't explained in this movie either. <laughs> there is just an ongoing gag that they kept. According to uh, according to uh, Talking Sopranos, the podcast with uh, Michael Imperioli and Stephen Shrippa, where they talk about it episode by episode. Oh man, uh, that is. That's Chrissy Moltisanti and Bobby Bacala. I did so, not know that was a thing. I'm gonna have to listen to that. Holy cow! Oh, they tell they they told a story about how that wasn't that was like an improvised thing thing, and then they just ran with yeah. it. Okay, yeah, Tony, See, Tony and I love that. And I love that Tony because Cerico and James Gandolfini was like, "Hey, how's your rash?" And like that <laughs> that just became a thing. I love that because, like, in Marvel, you know, we see these little nods and things that get improvised, and then they become, you know, fan like cult classics essentially where like fans love to make that reference you know like me and i remember when i sent the video of that uh iron man 2 the the alternate opening with the uh yes with when tony's on the ship and all that like that's this little thing that like i can reference and like you'll understand and stuff but like it's just a little nod and like it's cool that they have that in the sopranos too and we can you know get those little 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 things like that and I, I mean, I, like I, along with the familiar faces, you know, we saw we saw Polly Walnuts, oh, uh, yeah. younger versions. We saw Polly Walnuts, which is Walnuts, awesome. I think Silvio it's awesome. Dante. Oh, yeah, I, I mean, think it's getting awesome. Getting I think a it's prequel great. like that, it's cool to see with these characters because, like, we don't. And that's one thing Sopranos didn't do much was flashback. We don't see a lot of times where they go back. I mean, I can think of, I think maybe a handful of times where we ever really saw anything like that. So you know, getting to see these people that we saw in there, you know later years still live in this mob life we're seeing them as younger people trying to make their way in this stuff and that's kind of cool yeah Definitely. oh i love it and i think i mean even one of the even one of the flashbacks was actually they recreated one of the flashbacks yeah i noticed that too i noticed that too and they i will say they hit it like that look oh they nailed it i, yeah. I like i was watching it and was like i have literally seen this before. honestly on, yeah no that's an especially considering like you're someone who kind of took breaks and like watched it in that long of a span. Like the fact that they can hit it that hard on the head that you still connected it. You're like, Oh, I remember this. 
Yeah. And so, like, I think that's just one of those cool little things. That was another thing that I wanted to give a huge credit to the show for. I had never, ever taken that long to watch a show and finished the show. If I if I abandon a show after a season and I don't get back to that show for a couple weeks, I will not be making it right. back to that show. The Sopranos was different. I had to finish that show. Yeah, eventually. I think the only show, like, I didn't. I didn't binge the show and watch it the way I, I typically will. Like, you know, when I watched Breaking Bad the first time, I remember that was a show where I was like, that was the first serious show I'd kind of ever really gotten into. And mm -hmm. like when I watched it, it was just like I wanted to continue because I was like, I can't not I want to know what happens next. But like with Sopranos, it's like David Chase is trying to get you to think you almost feel like if you don't take a second, like if you if you just roll right into the next one, you almost feel like at least me anyway, I'm like, I feel like I probably am going to miss something or I didn't like catch something. And that's why it was great was I found the YouTube channel I texted or I texted you about that does a recap. Right. He did Sopranos Timber is what he called it. Uh, Pure Kino. Anybody interested in watching that? Show him some love. He put out some good videos in the month of September. He's got every episode of Sopranos recap, talked about, discussed. So that was just nice for a refresher before because I finished man, I finished Sopranos, I think about a month or two before. So it was nice to get a recap on some of the early seasons, especially. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I just like, it's one of those shows where it was just, I love the fact that I was able to, like you said, like I didn't watch it in the traditional sense of just like binge the shit out of it. Like I didn't take as long of breaks as you did, but it was like, there were times where like, I just wouldn't watch it for a few days and I'd be like, Oh, I, I didn't consciously think about it, but you know what? Now I want to go watch and like, I'm yeah, exactly. into it. And I think I'm that's part you. of it. David Chase wants his viewers to think so much watching these shows that like you almost owe it to him when you sit down to watch that you're kind of giving it at least three quarters, 75% attention, you know, at least minimum. It's not a show you can mindlessly just sit and play in the background. Not at all. And I and this this movie itself was, again, akin to the show because that the reason that show was it took so long to watch is because so much happens every single episode. Mm -hmm. Like you get an hour and storylines, maybe storylines aren't progressed. Most of the time they were, but you were getting to know a character if. Well, if there wasn't a story. And I think correct. like I think about it in this sense now, too, like we've talked about so many shows on this podcast. We've talked about Mandalorian, WandaVision, and, you know, it's not necessarily with WandaVision and the Marvel limited shows because those shows were so much shorter. There's no room for it. But, you know, in some of these shows like Mandalorian, where you got a little bit longer season, you got to have, you know, a handful of filler episodes. There isn't an episode in Sopranos you can look at that's a filler. You know, you don't sit there and watch one and think, ah, I didn't really get anything from that. And here's the thing. I think if there is an episode where you kind of feel like, oh, I didn't really get much there, just wait. Because I guarantee oh, yeah. you within you the rest of that around. season, you're going to understand that that episode may not have seemed very big or had many minute ramifications. But all of a sudden, by the end of the season, you see why that episode fits into this picture of this season. And I think that's why it's more important with Sopranos than any other show is to not think so episode to episode, but think more like season as a whole story. Because like I said earlier, it isn't a straight line. It's not seamless. They back in, you know, there's a lot of zigzagging. And a lot of times, you know, from episode to episode, there's different characters perspectives. And that changes the way that, you know, a story or an event that you had perceived as happening. All of a sudden you find out that it didn't quite happen that way and that it led to yeah. this, this and this. And you know, there's just things of that nature that I think Sopranos goes so much deeper into than any other show I've ever watched, at least, and definitely any uh, any show I think we've talked about on the show. Oh, I'm okay. I'm with you 100. percent And like I said earlier, you know, with all these with all these familiar faces like Polly, Silvio, we see we see uh, Tony, Livia, Janice, Johnny Soprano. Uh, I mean, we didn't get to know Johnny Soprano obviously at all in The Sopranos, but he was he was relevant all the time. Another character, relevant all the time, who we finally got to meet, Dickie Moltisanti, right. father to Chrissy Moltisanti. Uh, his, his story was one that I was, uh, I wasn't anticipate, I was very excited for. Uh, I wasn't anticipating, uh, like any of it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I just think, I think, 
if we can go back to the Sopranos and think about the one time or the most prominent episode where we're to, you know made to think about Dickie Moltisanti and and who that is outside of when you know Chrissy's you know mentioned him and talked about him a little bit, but the episode where can we spoil that up the the show we can, we can you know uh, I want to save that we'll save that a little okay, bit for the okay, deeper conversation enough. later. But, but knowing knowing what happens you know with. In the yeah. show, the you know what episode I'm probably talking about. It'll make more sense when we get to it. But um, I just feel like this story, seeing it, it, it does make him for an anticipated character. You want to know because it's like that specific. This you're hopefully finding the answer by the end of this movie to the largest question surrounding that character from the you know from what we saw from yeah. the show. So exactly. Um, I don't know. I can't wait to talk about specifically. Uh, like it'll be the opening scene. I can't wait to jump to it, and not not that we yeah. need to jump to it now, but I have had a thought no. ruminating all day since we started planning this, and I, I'm ready. I'm ready. I have I have one last thing I really want to mention. Yeah, no, for let's the go new, for, for it. the new characters. Uh, besides Dickie Moltisanti, who uh was fantastic and uh love the actor. I who what what's his name? I was just about to. I haven't, pull it I up haven't for seen us. him. I may have seen him before, but I hadn't recognized him. Like Alessandro, uh, Alessandro Nivola as uh, Dickie Moltisanti. Uh, I just he felt was like, fantastic. Yeah, I felt like the way he portrayed that character, just like the herky jerky, like that's very on par with what not only what we see from mob life in general from Sopranos and what we're, these guys are portrayed as is like they have so much at stake all the time and so many like things going on. That, you know, they got to be not only like head on a swivel, but I understand the herky jerky attitude and like why they're always all over the place. And, you know, like we're made to understand that these mob guys, like the way they live their lives, like just they will snap and like have these hair trigger moments. And like Dickie for a while seems like maybe he's a softer touch. And maybe I, he's I a love that. Maybe he's a I love type. that. Yeah. And, you know, obviously the movie, you know, you see an arc. Yeah. It, it happens. I mean, like, but... that's the thing. That's what's, that's another thing that the, the Sopranos has always made a point to show you. Yeah. Is, and the, he... is, the, is the multiple dimensions of these mobsters because, like, they can seem like the nicest guys on earth. Meadow at one point talks about uh, Vito in the, in the show, uh, her uncle Vito. Uh, to uh, her boyfriend, and she's like, she's like, oh, he's the nicest guy in the world. He would never do anything like. And like, meanwhile, all the while, you he's know. just threatening this motherfucker all yeah. the time. Like, you that's, know, uh, and you know. So I think that's where it is. It's like, I I love this character because I felt like it was maintained either longer or built a little harder. That he he did seem for a while like he really did want to do better, you know. And and I think knowing Chrissy is that knowing Chrissy's ambitions and how he's feel, uh, you know how we saw him feel in the conflict he was a lot of times feeling in the show it makes you understand and see a lot of similarity you can't help but see it you know a lot with those two and not just between Dickie and Chrissy I'd say I see even more similarities between Dickie and Tony and and like, that's where you so understand obvious. it because Tony gravitated so much more to Dickie in the movie. You see that, and it makes total sense. I just feel like I don't know, man. Tony just seemed oh, no. like it's hard. To, it, it was hard because once you get to those later seasons, all of a sudden that all that like stuff that you felt like he was trying to be better, maybe it just it slowly dissipates and dissipates and like yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't yeah, know. Yeah. Chrissy's just ending is so much more defin definitive that it, it does yeah. feel like he did actually have better intentions but at the same time well, and there's also the fact that he was he was just he, he, like in in the show chrissy's just a younger character yeah. too like yeah. he, 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 he's got he's ba well and i think that gets reflected in the different kinds of demons he battles you know we see tony battle a lot of different demons but he doesn't battle you know drug and substance addiction and that's yeah. something that chrissy constantly had to struggle with and i think that's just as a younger person, I feel like those older characters didn't understand addiction. Those older characters didn't think about it. They didn't understand that addiction was something that could actually be tough to fight with. And so Chrissy right, and was what, one what that they was didn't realize is that addiction is a like an, an ailment, essentially. They thought you, you can't control that, that yeah. shit. 
it, it's not not and I think that's where Chrissy being younger definitely comes into play is that he's more in touch with like this is so hard this is so hard for me to fight and like why you know why do I struggle and ultimately the conclusion at least I was made to find was that the only way Chrissy could probably ever kick anything like that for good is probably by kicking the rest of all of it is by kicking that lifestyle out the yeah. window. And when we, when he Absolutely. tried to do the best he could to do that and limit it from being, you know, in places where it's easy to fall into addiction again, that's when they, they turn him right back in essentially and yeah. make it impossible for him. So it's just one of those things where you feel, I, I just, I feel more, I guess, sorrow maybe is the word I'm looking I feel more like pain for Dickie and Chrissy than I guess I want to for Tony just because Tony makes it harder I am 100% with you I am 100% with you and another difference there you know Tony obviously grows up with some pretty shitty parents as we see with Livia and Johnny however Chrissy straight up grows up without a dad yeah like well, and I think what's uh, – it's just – you definitely see where Tony gets which sides from. Like, you can definitely see that when Tony wa- does want to be genuine and he does want to be, you know, caring or try to be better or has, you know, those deeper thoughts or those, you know, you can tell that's definitely the influence Dickie had on him. And you see that in this movie, how that gets there in in the show, you know. But I think then when Tony acts like, you know – Tony, essentially, I guess, when he leans into who he really, you know, can't run from being, I guess, is the way I would want to word it. That's the Livy, that's the Johnny, that's that, you know, in it. Bottom line, you you can't sugarcoat it. Dickie isn't a saner by any means. He's not an angel. However, the, the, the intent to do better and what I felt like they portrayed him as emotionally, I guess, a little better, what he wanted to try to be, it did seem a little more genuine. Like, it, it, it did. And maybe maybe that's not true. Maybe the action kind of says well, otherwise. But I don't here's, know. Here's my thing. And we'll get to we'll get to that more later. But one of the uh, one of the uh, main characters who he is opposite. The character he is opposite, who is brand new, we never met before, Harold McBrayer, uh, played by Leslie Odom Jr., who is just fucking fantastic. Killer, killer. Loved, loved him. Absolutely. And this character was, I'm not going to lie, a redemption for David Chase and all the writers of The Sopranos. Because here's the thing, they were fucking bad at writing black people. Yeah, I mean, you can see it. It's not, it, it isn't even hard to to say it's not hard to see it i mean you go back and you see the episode where chrissy and adriana are in the burger shop that's the the prominent one that's the most and then you know i think part of it sometimes there's a reason that's the most prominent one is because they didn't let them do that shit again they were like hey you can't write black people see because it's it's so it was so caricature and so over the top it was so painful to watch oh absolutely see here's where i think they do it when you're portraying the mob like that, like I feel like those thoughts are kind of in a sense there. That doesn't mean that they should be portrayed that way in that sense. However, like an episode where I think it what's it called? Um uh armed black man or something like that. Or or what's it called? Do you know what I'm talking about? When they essentially just blame the shooting on uh for uh I think it's for it's Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh they, god, they, it's Meadow's boyfriend and then you know they yeah. Vito wax him. Actually it's Vito that does it. Oh, spoiler, sorry. Uh no, it's cool. But yeah, um, like that, that, that was I think they tactic. Meant, that was know, a common tactic like, they yeah, used. Though. No, and that makes sense. See, like I get that. Like that's the mob. Like that's how they would go about doing things like that. And that's that makes sense. But like when we're portraying it like that, that just seemed and the weird thing was was how just like out of nowhere and random it felt was like i don't feel like you needed to do it that way at all like i feel like if you wanted to write a story kind of working towards that way he didn't have to be exactly as you said so character and cartoonish over the top like that's not how it is at all even back in that like even back when it was like in the early 2000s you know when you go look at a picture of like gucci Mane back then wrapping on lemons on the chain with the v cut like no that's still not like that wasn't even close like we're not even still no, no, not, i remember like massive genius do you remember massive genius <laughs> no, I, one? 
That's the one, I think that's the same episode. I think it's the same episode where they go to the burger joint. It's the rapper. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, Christy. he actually, it's the dude who plays Shocker, the second Shocker. Yeah, in yeah, yeah, yeah. Spider Man's uh, uh, Homecoming. Oh, uh, would, uh, ah, what's his name? Bokeem? Bokeem Woodbine? I think that's his name. Let me he's, a, he's a great actor. Yeah, no, I actually, I think somebody, it may have been, I can't remember. Somehow I came across this guy's IMDb page one time, and I was actually kind of impressed by. Um, oh no, he's been in a lot of shit. Yeah, and, he's, by, he's like, what and that's what out. lets me know. That's what lets me know they can't write black people because he's a fantastic right, actor, and they made him and, look and feel like that. Like you, he mm-hmm. could have ran with so much more. You could have tasked him, or just given him so much less, and said, "Hey, you run with it. You take it." And here's another thing. Maybe it shouldn't have been the Sopranos writers can't black can't write black people. It should have just been the Sopranos staff might might think about hiring black people. Yeah, that's, uh, that's also <laughs> a very good point. Yeah, that can help get the perspective in there. Yeah, but uh, nevertheless, uh, <coughs> I just I just loved that character. He was his character was a redemption for absolutely that, uh, for me. And uh, I I want to just go ahead and let's get to it. Yeah, let's, hey, let's uh, quick. Before we jump in, did you see David Chase, uh, why he kind of decided to talk about the riots and stuff and how he felt about that? Because I was actually kind of interested. He apparently he lived in New York or in that area and in that time, like his parents, he he grew up during those riots. And so I think he said it was something that he felt was very prominent and that he like had a good distinct memory of and felt like he had a segue there to tie in. So I've seen people say that they didn't feel like it felt like two separate stories or like and stuff like that. Like it shouldn't have been tied in. I I don't listen. I I don't know. Maybe I'm just a homer for what I like and what I have a past love for. But like I just didn't. I felt like I'm going to go ahead and dive in here. Spoiler free over the Newark riots are are important for Harold McBrayer's character. Right. Like that's all. Like they 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 are effective for Dicky Moltisanti and that he and the the rest of the mob and that they can blame their crimes on black people. Again, another example of just timeless institutional racism. Yeah, in America, and I mean as, they they as definitely in this nineteen sixties movie they are blaming all their crime on black people as like we were just talking about. They would do that in yeah. the Soprano show set yeah. in the two thousand. No, I, and I mean I think it definitely also just shows that like. I mean, it can show that the mob, like, use that as a growing point. Like, they use that as a jumping off point to, like, you know, like you said, they had a cover up. They they could operate under the radar and in that scenario and get away with a whole lot more. So, I mean, it's I don't know. I mean, I can see how it ties in. I mean, that's a distinct point where the mob might have taken a turn in New Jersey because the New Jersey mob is in real life and in the Sopranos has been portrayed as a little bit like less tight, like less, uh, you know, I guess they're not the biggest in this, family of the, you know, the crime families. The New Jersey ones are kind of you even hear them talk about not only in in the Sopranos. Do you hear the Italians talk about how they don't like the American Italians and stuff like that? But like mm-hmm. also, I just feel like, you know, the New Jersey mob is traditionally a little bit weaker than the rest of them. So I feel like using this as a point to show, hey, they did kind of make some ground and like gain strides through using that as a vessel to cover up everything. You know, it, it, I not only that, but in contrast, they were not the only ones who saw what was happening and realized, hey, we need to do something for our community. Right. So when Harold McBrayer is like, I'm going to open a book of my own, he's, he's, his plan is to do exactly what the mob is doing for black people. Well, like that, that. And I think that's him because he's like, man – Look at what look at how they live. Look at how they capitalize off of all of this shit. And then look at what my like look at what my people are having to go through and have to deal with. Like if I can hope like I think that's the one thing you can say about the mob is like bar none, they look out for their people. Like whether obviously wrong, but like 
when they get the stuff, they take care of the people that are tied to them. They take care of the yeah. people. There aren't any Italians in that community in that time frame of this movie that are living down bad, really. Like they're getting looked after for the most part. If you have a connection or a tie, you're in that mob, neighborhood. If you're in, you're that looked yeah. after. In, in bare minimum, you're at least protected. They're not gonna let some shit go on with you. You know what I mean? So. Mm -hmm. I think to the same point, like, I can understand why McBrayer wants, he wants his piece of the pie. He's like, if they're going to do it, well, then shit. Why can't I? Like, so I. And, I, I mean, and his, his, his portrayal and his character arc was definitely the, the one that re I really uh, found compelling. Because yeah, no, I agree completely. The entire time, the entire movie, you were led to believe at the end of this movie he is the one who is going to have Dickie Moltisanti killed. Mm -hmm. And another example of the whole Sopranos, yeah, we're going to lead you one way. Gotcha. Actually, we've actually been laying the seeds for a whole other thing for, uh, in the background. Houdini. Dude, and on rewatch, I rewatched the movie today for the first time since I watched it the first time. And uh, I, I, I obviously on, on this watch, I watched Junior Soprano character more. Uh, just and because he the, ends up yeah, and look for he ends up being the most important. And I mean, like you look at uh, when uh, he picks Johnny up from prison, and he's like, w "Look, he, look at Dicky Moltisanti. Yep, that was the his first dad thing. dies. Yep, yep. And and his it dad dies and steps up. It reminds me of how Chrissy felt with Tony. It reminds me of how Chrissy felt with Tony when he wanted more on his plate and he wanted Tony to go to bat for him and Tony wouldn't do it. Tony make you know, uses his capos, you know, and he, he rides with them and doesn't, you know, at that point in the series anyway. And so I just feel like we've seen a lot of this stuff before and it's just like it's like you said, when you watch it the first time, you lean. You do. It, it's impossible not to. They are they are making you do that just so they can pull the rug out at the last minute. And Chase is one of, uh, he's a great, he's a great director in that sense. He does that better than a no, lot and of I love, I love that Junior Soprano, like now, and this it, is a whole other thing to, to watch the Sopranos. It makes with sense because night. look at what he did. He wants Tony whacked at one point in the series. It, this feels like the first step towards junior becoming just, i mean like he was already an ass i mean he, you hear him on the phone ah oh, you, your sister's cut yeah that, that whole thing you hear you hear that every every time and Corey stole was just fucking fantastic as a young junior soprano uh but i think this was like the first time you know he he had someone whack he had a made guy whacked he had like which is an important person which whacked. is entirely if anyone knows mob rules and if you've watched the sopranos you know you don't you don't you don't whack a made guy without permission from well, and then like i i just watched goodfellas the other night too and like that's like one of that's yeah, one of the it, things they're like well, hey we we just whacked a made guy and that is not something you do unless you've organized a sit down and have permission. everything you can to avoid it mm -hmm. like that's that's the thing. And, and, and in Sopranos, we see that so much, how many times people wanted to have people whacked and the sit down stops that or prevents that. And mm -hmm. so, like, I just, you know, it's one of those things where I don't know. Or Junior Junior in down. Sopranos seemed like a very whiny slash entitled like he didn't ever really like in Sopranos. I never felt like I saw Junior do enough to like like here's what I'll say about Tony. Tony wanted to make the money, wanted to be the boss, and Tony took steps to make the fucking money. Tony was always, it, he may have done some really fucked up things to go about getting it. He may have crossed people that he shouldn't have, all this and that, everything. But he was about his bread, and he was about making money for the whole crew. He wanted that crew to have power. Junior wanted to be in charge of it and lead it and run it, but then wouldn't get active in trying to make and i get he's an older character so it's not as easy but i don't feel like junior just expected it to kind of all fall into his lap and you see him get constantly overlooked and it's because he doesn't ever stand up or go out and make it happen and this movie is is incredibly important in seeing how that comes to yeah, be no he's, exactly johnny johnny is gone for four years it is his opportunity to take over make sure everyone knows he sh like he 
can and should shit be runs at the through him. Shit runs through him is what should he have been established. He couldn't wait. Couldn't wait to tell them, like, hey, Johnny's away. I, I control shit now. Uh, all this shit runs through me. Uh, and then he does a bad job. Yeah. And, and it's like, he, he said, he, he writes it off. He's like, I had a lot going on. I had to do this. I had to do this. I had to do this. And it's like, everybody who's in charge has to do this and has to do this and has right. to do this. That's just like, that's look at, look at what it drove Tony to. Tony had to go see a, freaking psychiatrist because of it essentially just yeah. the load and and the stress and the in the mental aspect of that which is a whole brilliant brilliant way to frame it a, a whole nother oh, no, story like the but, fact that the whole like the whole story the whole soprano show is and, about tony's psychological health and, and what i will fantastic. say what i will say is i can't stand the the finish to the arc of melfi however that is a whole different conversation about a whole different no thing. Shit. But you can't stand the end of that arc. I just it didn't feel complete enough. I just wish there would have. I wish. I don't know. I, I see, I'm with you. I thought like instantly. I was like, that's it. But then I thought even more, and I was like, yo, that should have been it. Fucking six seasons ago, she should have kicked him the fuck out of her office in season one. Right. That's what should have happened. So like. The fact that that's how it ultimately ends, I'm just like, for me, that was like a fucking final. Okay. You know, like, I see what you're saying. Cause like, you want to root for her. It's like, hey, this isn't good for you because you could see the headspace Tony occupies. I, you don't ever see her meet with other clients, but like, you get the sense that when she meets with Tony and the way she, you know, we've seen her interact outside of work and think and she talk thinks about, about Tony, Tony quite a bit. And, you know, it's like, man, she's kind of probably inhibited at her job a little bit with others because of Tony and the headspace he's occupying. And, you know, it makes total sense that Tony, as selfish and as much as he wants, it makes total sense that he would occupy that headspace, and that's probably exactly what he wants. But that's, again, a whole other conversation. But I just, I had to, had to say that. Because I just think Junior, he just has this whiny nature, but he doesn't go do anything he's he's a he is the you know apex spectator you know in sports you hear a coach say hey, well are you playing or are you spectating pay me the five dollar spectator fee you know make sure you pay for your admission that's what junior's whole entire like he has like you said in this movie and then in the show we see him have a legitimate chance to take the reins and be the guy and and be like yo Shit runs through me, and I'm going to have my hands on all the shit that comes through this mob and, like, the shit that we do, and I'm going to fucking make the money. And he just expects it to happen, and I what think— can he, what, what do you do when that's not happening for you? Yeah. I'll just fucking kill the guy. Yeah. And that's just saw. I think he takes the coward's way out. I think Junior— is const like in Sopranos, I feel like we were supposed to see that, that he's kind of cowardice, but I feel like you see that this wasn't something that happened with old age or something that, you know, he got old and expected shit to happen for him because he was old. Like, no, he's been thinking this for quite a while. He never had that do it attitude. And they also make the point to tell you that, like, he's also like for the standards of like getting into being like a, a top player. He's already a little late to the game, even at this point. Like, I like I remember whenever that, like, in the show, he's pissed that Tony is chosen over him. He was pissed before that when April was chosen over him, and he was pissed before that when Johnny was chosen over. Him. Right. So like, like, he, like he was just like he, he always expected more and more and more, and just like he wasn't gonna get it because he wasn't that dude, right. and he just no, couldn't. I, I, I just. I think he was a guy that said things from, you know, essentially the stands always. He never wanted to actually get into the field and make sure and get his hands dirty, essentially, which, like, we see with Tony. When Tony had that New Jersey crew in the heyday of success and when they were doing the most, Tony was hands-on with all of that shit. And we can talk about, I mean, obviously, if that was healthy for him, yes or no, you know, obviously, but, like, he was doing it because he's like, the safest hands are my own. And if I start taking a back seat, they're going to lose respect and they're going to lose not only that, but they're going to start trying to exclude me from shit. And that's when all the shit goes south. You know, if he's right. going to like junior just didn't lack 
he or he didn't have that like way of not only kind of intimidation and fear to kind of keep people tight knit and loyal. I mean, as crooked as that sounds, Tony did leverage fear a lot with these people. I mean, no secret. Dude was a fucking behemoth. Yeah. Like, no, like James Gandolfini was like 6'4", 270 and, pounds. Like, this man was fucking huge. And look at, uh, you see it in a lot of episodes, and uh, you, you literally see Tony even pretty much say it to us as viewers when he kicks the shit out of his bodyguard that's like a yoked-ass dude. And he just snaps and kicks his ass because he's like, I just had a heart attack. I got to show these motherfuckers I'm still like that. And, like, Junior ain't doing that. Junior ain't going to show. And, like, here's the thing. Jackie ran that mob when he was older still. And, obviously, we didn't really get to see it because, you know, Tony pretty much takes over because Jackie's dead right at the beginning of the show. But I'm assuming, you know, Jackie had that crew still pretty tight, probably because Jackie had commanded respect from early on. He was when he was crumbing up in the game and coming up, he was respected. Junior isn't respected because he didn't do anything to earn it. He didn't get his hands dirty. Junior's the type of dude who slips and falls and you laugh at his fucking Right. Right. That's right. That's the type of dude that he is. And and with that, let's let's talk some more Dicky Moltisanti and his storyline yep. in this. Let's do it. Uh, so we, we we begin with him and Tony. You know, we see them at first, and I love Christopher Moltisanti. That's exactly what I wanted to talk about. I just love that immediately we jump in. The first thing we hear is is Chrissy. I met Death not far from here, on Route Twenty Three, and and especially that that's what we hear is it's like they're not that like we are you know supposed to be thinking about all of that like that's that definitely like chase is just saying hey like you remember all this stuff that happened right like this you're gonna see shit that's gonna you know apply to that and like i just love that we still get to see this from chrissy's perspective a little bit we're not forced not only to just think about it from chrissy's perspective or how this stuff goes on to affect chrissy later in life i love that we hear his perspective to a degree tony the guy I went to hell for. I mean, I was like that line oh. right there, because that that's one of the hardest hitting lines from Sopranos as a whole, I feel like. And especially from Chrissy is that, you know, that's him, Adriana. That's the man I'm going to hell for, my Uncle Tony. And then you hear that exact same thing. And it's just like you're reminded about, God damn, like you really feel that sympathy for Chrissy again. And we haven't even seen him in the movie. We're just hearing his voice. And like. Then, you, you know, once baby Chrissy comes along, it gets even more prevalent that it's like, man, this is so fucked. No, and it's like, it's like they're making a weird, like, Sopranos was always about that, like, weird mystical side of things where it's like, yeah, it's it's definitely artistic. It's definitely taking artistic liberties, but they're also alluding to, like, these things are happening to the characters. How realistic that is, I don't know, but deal with it. So, like, whenever she's, whenever the lady at the dinner table is like, you know... They say babies, they know things from the other side. Mm -hmm. That's I I take that as that's the voiceover. We're hearing we're hearing Chrissy who knows all the shit. Yeah, well, I mean think about it also when I think Polly's a great example of that. Polly is essentially in the show, I feel like one of the biggest vessels for what you're talking about right there with like that kind of like a mythical, I guess, side of things or whatever, is like Polly when Chrissy's dead and the cat. In in Satrialis and yeah. you know all we're led to believe there and just you know Polly seeing uh the Virgin Mary and the Bing, I mean it's they haven't been afraid to embrace it. So at this point, it's almost like you I can't saw the you, Virgin Mary. You, you can't exactly discount Three it. Three times, Stone. Three times. <laughs> That's all. your your impressions. No, so, I'll tell so you right what. There. The way they portrayed the young the young guys was just so spot. Oh man, like Silvio, it's so funny. young Silvio Dante, perfect. Young Polly, uh-huh. perfect. Young Pussy. Oh yeah. I was like Pussy Bump and se-. and the fact that whenever Chrissy went to go see us, uh, oh, what was his name? Uh, when whenever they-, they put the drill in that dude's mouth. Oh, the tire. Yeah, 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 yeah. I just I thought it was really really like as as the parallel here between like the mob life of Dicky Moltisanti and Tony Soprano. Well, it feels here, like we've seen this holding... before. It feels like we've seen this before, but also seeing Paulie freak out about it getting on his 
his coat and, and all that shit, his appearance. That. It's like that. The fact that the guy Dickie was bringing to do shit like this is the same guys that, that Tony brings to do shit like this. Well, it's it's still Polly. It's still Silvio. And, it, is, it was still pussy up until that. You know, and what I also love about it is like – We've been told in the show that Dickie had a pretty profound impact on Tony, and in in the movie, we're definitely led to believe that like Dickie's a he's the whole reason. Well, you he's know, everything. Yeah, exactly. So I love that like we're seeing that like Tony wants to trust the dudes that were around when Dickie was around. In a sense, like he's not going to ride with anybody else. He's like, oh well, Dickie was like the guy for me. These were his guys. I want those guys. Like I want. And Paulie it really makes. It, it really makes clear the age discrepancies in that crew in New Jersey because that was one of my main thoughts the entire time of the show. I was like, what the fuck's going on here? We've got like, we got Silvio right. and Pauly who are like 60 fucking years old answering to, answering to Tony who's and I like, I think that uh, speaks 40. volumes to what those guys in that crew would respect is because Dickie was, I mean, Dickie at the same time was the same age. But look at the similarities between Dickie and Tony. They respected Dickie. It's no surprise that they're going to respect Tony, even though he's younger, because mm -hmm. he's like what they used to ride for. They used to ride for Dickie and the shit that he, you know, the way he did business. And so it's no surprise that when we get to the show, they're going to side with a guy like that. They aren't going to want Junior at the home. They like the young, the fire. They like that in Tony because it probably reminds them of Dickie. And, you know, Dickie had that crew doing some pretty I mean, bad shit, but good shit in terms of, like, what the goals of the mob are. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, in terms so of like, making money. Yeah, so uh, it's no surprise. They're like, hey, that recipe kind of worked with Dickie. Why not, Tony, you know? Why not press it? So, I, lo I also love that at the end of this movie uh, – uh, we'll, get, we'll, get, we'll get to it later. Uh, but I, I like the, the sprouting of Dickie and Tony's relationship, as we see at the beginning – uh, whenever they they go to see Ray Liotta, uh, Hollywood Dick Moltisanti, yep. uh, with his uh, with his new wife uh, Giuseppa, and uh, I I just love that first interaction, like the very first thing, five bet five bucks who sees him first, and Tony's like, hey, I don't even have five bucks, and like, and Dicky going, I think you better win, like I, this is a very very child childlike way but, to show exactly what they do yeah like, exactly that's what i was gonna what say what is that's how they do business but on a much bigger scale is by scheming yeah. those guys look at um oh gosh i probably should know the actor's name he's actually been in a lot of different things he plays i think he plays the bad guy in t2 he's the other terminator it's, oh he, he's got a kid that goes to school with, I think, Meadow or whatever. He owns a sporting goods store. And Tony's like, hey, I'll let you in the yeah. game anyway, even though he's already in yes. debt. And then he goes even further down the rabbit hole. And it's like, that's how they get you is they suck you in and say, oh, well, you better win. Like, you know, you, you got it. You can do it. Knowing like yeah. hey, if he wins, he still owed me money anyway. And if he loses, oh, baby, Ooh, you know, baby. that essentially becomes a guy that's just like, you can have him do whatever you want now because otherwise you just can't take his money. Okay, yeah. So that yeah, character specifically from The Sopranos is like, you know, an example of what you were just talking about. It's like that's how they suckered these people, you know? 100%. 100%. And uh, there, there there, are a couple instances where it just felt like, like some light foreshadow, like several instances of just like light foreshadowing or straight up foreshadowing. And, uh, but there were several interactions between Dickie and Tony that I just absolutely loved. Oh, like, uh, the one from later the trailer, on, the one from the trailer is fantastic, of course. Oh, yes. Where, where it's, hey, you, hey, this is the last time I'm ever going to steal something. And Tony's like, yeah. You Tony like, oh yeah, I can uh, see how I can validate this shit in my head. Like, yeah, okay, right. so like I'll just take it this once. Yeah, and then like I'll every time it. I take from then on out, hey, it's the last time, it's the last time. And then, you know, eventually, hey, there will be a last time, I'm sure, sometime down the road. But until yeah. then, you know, it'll be the last time. We'll just keep rolling it back. <laughs> my favorite interaction in the whole movie between them, though, was when he walks into the room and he's reading the comic book and he's like, can't you read a normal comic, Superman, Jughead? And he's like, no, I'm reading this one. It's about uh, it's about this, 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 and this. And he's like, I didn't know there were Jews in the medieval times. And he's like, 
And Tony goes, and it was just it, like this young kid just nailed the Tony Soprano delivery because he went, well, the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because it's just Tony having that snark about him. You, it's so funny. Like, I don't, I guess it makes total sense. You look at who he grew up with, with Livy and with Johnny. He's going to obviously at a young age probably have that snark, especially when you know how much he got in trouble in school as a kid. But it is yeah. funny, like you said, to see it. Like, he, he's like, hey. And as it pertains to Livia specifically, um, there's another layer here. I mean, obviously, the, the first couple seasons of The Sopranos are largely about Tony's relationship to his mom. Right. That's, that's a very huge element of the, of the show. And uh, we see not, not only is it the typical mother issues – that would come with his situation. Right. Another, an, like there's also the fact that he glommed on to Dickie Moltisanti because that was the only person she was happy about. I didn't even think about that. And man, that is a huge thing. I miss God. See, and that's where I, I, that's where I didn't have time today. I was at class and baseball. I didn't get to rewatch, but that is a good point. Like she did have, she definitely took a liking to Dickie. He, he, Whenever they're at uh, Janice's confirmation and and Dickie walks over and he's like, hey, your daughter's confirmation. And then she's like, I'm sitting over here. Like, like, what do you come on over? Like, <laughs> well, and it makes me it makes me think about Tony. And it's like, OK, like, you know, you've seen Tony put on the charm in, in Sopranos a lot. And like you kind of start to pick up on, OK, like. You know he's probably not getting that from, like, you know, your Polly. Like, he's not smooth like that. He's not picking it up from those guys. And so it makes mm-hmm. sense that the one that he, like you said, he gravitates to and kind of molds himself a little bit after is the one that he felt like gave him the best chance to probably make his mom want to love him a little more, I guess. Yeah. Like, no, it's it, it, that exactly. simple. That's, that's ultimately it. It's, it, like... I I, wa- I I remember I was like watching earlier today and whenever he approaches him and is like, uh, like my mom, she's, she needs help. She's been told she needs to take this medication and she won't listen to me. I know that she definitely won't listen to my fucking dad. And like, he's been shown like, there's nobody else in his life. It's crazy. There's nobody else in his life. I would recommend he look up to. Right. Right. Dickie's the best option. No, he really is because, uh, you know, it, you're like, like I, I, your point is so solid because obviously telling any child to look up to a mob figure, of course, n- not ideal. However, yeah, he was fucked. He was yeah fucked no exactly, what. and that I think gets reflected in this movie with Chrissy's story too. Is like we'll get there. I really, my thought really has to reside with Dickie and Hollywood Dick specifically in that kind that whole relationship and everything is really where I had those thoughts. Um, but I mean, that dysfunction is prevalent and like it's, it shows up in this movie. And I just, that was one of the big takeaways I had was like how it's so easy to see how Chrissy can not only be torn so much in the show based on what we see, like what he was forced to grow up with, but also kind of like what shaped him to have the attachment he did, you know, like it it makes a lot of sense. Well, no, it is crazy that like Tony was the father figure of sorts in. Which is funny because in the movie we're shown that Chrissy doesn't really take a liking or gravitas towards Tony at all uh, as a baby. Not when he's a baby. Yeah. And and that's, yeah. yeah. And that's, I think what's funny is it's like, Man, if only he was as wise as he was when he was a baby. Like, is essentially the well, there's, gist. But... There's a scene. There's a scene uh, where he's like, uh, whenever he's like, all the indictment, like all these indictments came down, and I wish I was here before that. Like, I wish I was like able to grow up. It, it almost sounds like he wishes he would have been able to grow up with Tony instead of under Tony. Because, right. I mean, whether you like it or not, I mean, like, I don't know though, because like. I think there's a distinct point in the show where that probably changes because like, I think at one point, like that relationship was actually pretty strong and sturdy. And I feel like Chrissy felt like what he was investing was actually, you know, working towards paying off in some sense, even if it didn't come as early as he would have liked. 
Um, yeah. And then I feel like the distinct change is once he gets that, he sees how much that relationship changes and falls apart on him. And I think, you know, it's hard because I feel like one of the key points of falling apart in that relationship is the addiction issues, Chrissy battles. And I feel like it sucks because like you want to feel bad for Chrissy, but at the same time, you also understand Tony because like Tony probably wishes he would be better. Like he wishes this road that Chrissy wouldn't have ever ended up down you know, an addiction road. But then you got to think about as Tony, like, how have I contributed to making this happen, essentially? And that's where Tony doesn't really look into. So Right. Right. But. Nah, yeah. I, uh, I, I remember whenever uh, Tony, you know, does the deed, kills, uh, kills Chrissy. I, I, like, it was so sudden, so, so quick, such a quick decision it remind it reminded me a lot of i mean he he obviously didn't lose his cool the way that dicky does on his dad here but i right. felt like there was an i felt like there was a well, parallel there he essentially wanted to had. take it into his own hands to be the judgetary and executioner of like i am going to be the one that brings judgment down to you like he's like you would have just killed your daughter over addiction essentially is is tony's essential judgment and you deserve to die mm -hmm. for that not like, oh, hey, let's switch seats so I can take this charge because you're fucked up. It's like, I'm not claiming that that was also okay. I, I see, obviously for Christy, that's the only route. Like, that's his only, like, way that he saves it, you know, essentially. Yeah, yeah, for sure. However, you know, if you're Tony, is it, instead of being the judge, jury, and executioner of, like, you don't deserve to live anymore after what just happened, why isn't it, oh, how about I just let you take this charge, and then you'll fucking be forced to go get the help? And, like, I... Un reason there is he's in... The reason here is that he was like, if... I think that runs even deeper. The addiction makes him so careless that he could have potentially killed his daughter. Okay, if he could have potentially killed his daughter, what else could the addiction cause? Okay, could the addiction enough. cause him to get taken in and then fold on us? Well, he and also has pussy as a prime example of what happens when you get involved with drugs. So I, I, I see that is also true. It's just one of those things, though, like I said, where it's like, you know, I see how Dickie does it, too. Like, he took that into his hands. And, like, Dickie's, I, I agree, his felt much more out of rage. His felt much more like, oh, god damn it! And, and it, it was it was years of suppressed rage. However, because he was talking it, about it is how... definitely a little bit of like he's trying to be the judge. He wants to be bring the judgment down upon his dad for what like just you know like you said suppressed rage. He's seen it all for too long, and you know, yeah, I. I just I do see the similarity though. It's just like you said. I think Dickies is a little more rage induced, but that doesn't make it any uh, less, I guess, valid per se. Oh no, not at all. Yeah. not at all. Don't get me wrong. I was just saying that. Like, yeah, that no, no, it did feel it felt different, but I think the like gist of it is definitely right on similarity. Um, no, I just think I love that. Like when we see Dicky and Hollywood Dick interact, I just love that it is all dysfunction all the time with those two. And I think it's just like when what we've seen with these mob families and not even just necessarily the mob families, but the families that are even tied in somehow, some way, look at Artie and Charmaine, they fucking go through dysfunction and struggle like nobody else. And they aren't necessarily in the mob, but like they have that tie and they have that relationship and they are, Helpless to essentially get out of it. Charmaine tries and Artie's response is going more in depth into the relationship to try to fix it with salad dressings and such. You know, it's it's like you see the dysfunction that this causes. And I think like to know that Chrissy grew up in an environment not unlike not not unlike that of Tony's. Obviously, Chrissy being different because he had no parents. Essentially, yeah, yeah. he yeah, didn't he have a dad. Mom, but... Yeah, he had his mom, but he didn't have his dad. Um, but like knowing that dysfunction, like look at what AJ and Meadow had to deal with seeing him, with their parents. Look at what um, Vito's children had to deal with their with his with their parents. Like all of these children have essentially had horrible ways. Like it sucks because they're afforded everything. They're afforded everything they could ever have or want. But when it comes from and they are act and see the things that they see, 
it's no wonder we get Vito's Vito's son lashing out, you know, and acting the way he acts in the show when we see that. It's no wonder we see AJ go through the struggles and turmoil and, you know, issues he goes through. It's no wonder we see Meadow having such a hard time finding what she wants to do because it's like, I don't know what drives me. I don't know what the passion is because, like, I'm so used to having it not only all afforded, but, like, it all seems so weird. Like, I don't know where, like, I need... With Meadow, I feel like the conclusion we arrive at is like she needed something that was morally fulfilling for her. And that's why I think we Mm -hmm. see her go from being doctor to being, you know, going into the law school path and stuff is like she wanted to try to do something that could probably ease her conscience of knowing, hey, I'm here based on a lot of bad things. And like I love with Meadow that that's the perspective because she's the oldest one. She's one of the only kids we actually see get to grow up and like especially since she's a girl, you know, a woman, she doesn't get the uh Jackie Jr. type of growing up, you know, where it's right. growing up to, you know, the inevitable being of being into it, you know, being into that life. Um I love that with Meadow, it's like we get to see a little bit different of a perspective. And with Meadow, I think it's really interesting because she's almost like I feel like she doesn't express her guilt, but I feel like her going to the law side of things is kind of her way of trying to ease that guilt and make up for it in a sense, you know. I I always viewed cuz I always viewed that a little a little differently. I I don't know that it's to ease her guilt. I think she goes in to be a public defender. So she I, th- I think if I remember correctly, that's what it ended up being. I just I remember they focused a lot on the serving like of like she was trying to serve for like at the time when she was hoping out at the law office. It was like a lot oh, of yeah, like, like immigrants. Yeah, I think, I and stuff, and yeah. It, yeah. So I feel like I don't know. I just feel like it's again, like when it was all afforded for her and like she's raising that, it's probably really hard to make a decision on like what my life is going to look like post all of that. You know what I mean? It's like, there isn't a clear cut blueprint because like a lot of the people we see grow up still have things fall apart. Like, um, Oh gosh, why am I struggling so hard? Uh, who's, I don't know why I feel stupid for blanking on this name. It's, he ends up having cancer. He goes to jail at the end and then he dies. His daughter gets married. He gets arrested at the, or he gets taken away in cuffs. He cries and everybody makes fun. Oh, Johnny Sack. Johnny Sack. Yes. God damn it. I'm so pissed. I forgot that name. I kept thinking Johnny, but then I'm like, that's Tony's dad. Um, like Johnny Sack's daughter, for example, like look at what she went through. Like she grew up and had her marriage. She got married. We see Meadow getting ready to get married, but we see that just because all of that stuff flows like a normal life, it's never normal. It always comes back. There is always going to be that looming, like, dread slash figure, even though you may not directly be involved. Like, Meadow knows she has no consequence. But, like, right. that is derailing life happenings right there. Like, the things that happen to Johnny Sack and their family, like, you see. And I just feel like that's what I love about uh, Meadow's story is it's just, like, seeing a woman, you know, a daughter of a mobster, the woman growing up and stuff. It's like, that's just... You know, you get to see that dysfunction. I feel like, you know, it's just different from boy to woman. And that's why I think Chrissy. Oh, absolutely. And that's why I think the dysfunction with Chrissy is just that much more amplified is like when we see it in this movie, like, I mean, Dickie killed his own dad. Dickie killed his own dad in a fit of rage. No, like that's something that like even the monstrous Tony we saw didn't even kill his mom who was like the worst and essentially tried to have him killed like he didn't retaliate junior tried to have him killed at one point and also shot him and tony didn't retaliate and even when junior is like getting ready to die and it's all the way at the end and tony really hasn't spoken to him or has always said he wants nothing to do with him what's he do in the last episode we see him go visit him and he try he tries to stoke that conversation of like what that relationship kind of at one point used to feel like. Um, and I, I think that just like speaks volumes, I guess, is just like, there's that dysfunction and dysfunction in the mob family. And that's something David Chase always leans on. It's always prevalent. And it's why we see what happens to, you know, your Jackie juniors, your Chrissy's even to them. Chrissy's got it the worst because 
you know, Jackie Jr.'s dad wasn't around when it was kind of happening to get tied in. Jackie Jr. just felt like he needed to get tied in to, you know, I guess for the legacy of his dad in a sense. Yeah. Chrissy did that shit because he looked up to those people genuinely because that was all he had. And that's a product of all of the dysfunction that led, you know, Dickie killing his own dad and like the family life that gets created when Dickie dies. Like all of that dysfunction leads and drives to what ends up happening. Like you can literally look at that and identify it specifically as like something contributing to what Chrissy's ultimate demise, essentially, you know? Mm -hmm. And well, I also, I also loved that Ray Liotta played his grandfather uh because. There isn't a character I feel like Chrissy Moltisanti is more inspired by than Ray Liotta's character in Goodfellas. Like, uh, it, that movie opens with the line, all my life, I always wanted to be a gangster. And, like, that's what Chrissy, like, that right. was always Chrissy's plan. Right. He was always going to be a gangster. He was always going to get all the, he was get, but he wanted the lavish lifestyle of it. He mm-hmm. didn't didn't want the well as a young as a young and you don't ever think about that you know and i think that's part of it too is like growing up in that lifestyle as a child you see and live through the lavish you don't experience or see or witness unless you know you talk tony talks about how he saw his dad i think it's tony or maybe it's chrissy i can't remember but cutting off the finger at such realities how he saw that you know um i think it was tony right i'm pretty sure anyway um you know, outside of little things like that, they those kids don't grow up seeing the things that they have to deal with. And like as a kid growing up in that lifestyle, you're afforded a lot of things. Like look at what AJ and Meadow were given. And it's like they didn't see what his dad was going through. Like he may have been irritable and stuff, and that leads them to believe like, oh, maybe things are not very good right now. But they yeah. aren't understanding or knowing like all of the deep and dark happenings. And, like, I feel like that's part of it is, like, it's easy as a kid when those are the people that you're surrounded with to glorify that image of, like, oh, all I see and understand is the rich and the lavish. So I want that. And that what they do is how they get it. So I need to do what they do. Well, and it's also fascinating because there's a point there's like the beginning of this movie, Tony and like Johnny Soprano and Livia and Janice and Tony, they aren't living the high life by any means when he's a young guy. Well, and I think oh. that's rel- – I think part of it is just, like, relative. Like, I'm sure they're living, like, like – They're living better. In the, in the times, like, you know, maybe not necessarily – they're not – like, obviously, in our version of Sopranos, we see it with, like, big a fancy houses and, you know, the material things. But, you know, mm-hmm. it's also no secret, like, they probably – I feel like we've seen like they have TV sets that are like nice and like, you know, the age old, True. oh, it fell off a truck type wing thing, you know, like. Well, that that's that's where it changes. Whenever he is older, whenever we get that jump forward, we actually get a get a line directly from Chrissy where he goes at, at some point in high school, the Sopranos moved into the suburbs, the black thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and like he just he just says it like that, and it's like God, that was disgusting, but it's so Sopranos. And then and then uh and then he goes uh, and I think this move made Tony kind of a pussy, and uh, it it is important like that that is important because Tony sees what living comfortably would be like outside of this life. That's what he wants for AJ. He doesn't want AJ to be a mobster. He wants AJ to be normal. He wants him. If I was my dad, if I if I wouldn't have done what my dad did, I would have been a patio furniture salesman. And we also got a line in this where Olivia expressly states, like, he should go work for my uh, for my brother and my brother in law at the patio furniture business. Uh, I didn't. But in the in like hearing that, like, yeah, AJ wasn't really pushed towards that life. In a, for the most part, and like you kind of see Tony, like anytime AJ kind of starts showing like tendencies towards dri- like Tony sees the similarities from like when he lashed out as a kid. I think Tony's smart enough to understand like those lashings and stuff. Like obviously, paint a picture that leads to what ends up being Tony's ultimate character, and you know how he is who he is. Um, mm-hmm. It just makes me sad, I guess, that like. It's probably just the young in Tony that and and Dickie knowing who Dickie was. Of course, he probably wants Chrissy to be the second coming of Dickie because he looked up a lot to Dickie, thought he could be close to Chrissy. He was for a while very close with uh, Chrissy. 
I just feel like it's sad that, you know, he, when it's his own son, he wants to push him away, but from that life, but like Chrissy, you know, he claims he loves him so much, but he pushed him as far into it as he possibly could. And, it was, know, it was absolutely that, that was his outlet. He didn't have to do it to AJ, but, because, but he, and again, yeah. Dickie, like it's, it's so sad. Dickie's getting shot in the back of the head signs Mo- Chrissy's death note. Like, that's it. Mm-hmm. Like, because as soon as Tony's the one who's the takes the reins, authority you know. figure in his life, yeah. that's it. That that's that rats. marks, like, ultimately what leads. Because who knows, maybe what we're led and what we see with Dickie, I feel like we're led to believe that Dickie would have been probably in a sense of a, a kind of divine intervention for Chrissy, where like he would have probably pushed Chrissy away from that life. I feel like that's what we were made to see and believe is based on like, why do you paint Dickie as kind of like a, a, a better than most, I guess, in a sense, or maybe that's yeah. the wrong way of putting it. But like, you saw Dickie, I feel like he had a heart. Yeah, like putting he was, more of an effort into being, you know, wearing that heart genuine. on his sleeve and showing that he actually, you know, could have some, you know, good character in him, I guess. Um, I feel like we're led to believe that because, like you said, him dying is probably the distinct marker of like it's all downhill from here, Chrissy. Like you're gonna fall down a pretty dark path because of this exact moment. And, you know, it sucks because you probably do get the sense that Dickie would have had a definite impact and change on what would have likely happened. I think oh, certainly, Dickie probably doesn't allow Tony to try to push Chrissy into that way. Or Dickie probably tries to pull Chrissy away from that in general, similar to what we see Tony do with AJ. Um, you know, it's it's a whole slippery slope. You know, you think about if Dickie survives and Dickie continues to make his way in the mob, makes his money, makes his money. You know, does he follow the same kind of path as Tony, where it's move to the suburbs, afford your kids everything they can to be successful outside of mob life, outside, make their own money. Or, you know, in some cases, I feel like the mob pushed the daughters to marry rich. But, you know, right. regardless, like, get your life taken care of away from me and I can always help. But like, at least then that gives me peace of mind that like I pushed you away from this. I wanted you to be better I, uh, the you know the uh the tony stark iron man to spider-man you know it's like i wanted to be like you No, i wanted you to be better that kind of thing like it's it's the same and it and it's even it's even more evident in that like whenever he's visiting whenever dickie's visiting sally in in prison uh hollywood dick's brother uh and sally tells him hey you want to help tony Stay the fuck away from him. Right. Because every time he came and talked to him, Sally kind of put together, okay, you killed your dad and you killed Jessapina. You did you did both of those things. Uh, stay the fuck away from him. If you want to help him, you shouldn't be in his life. Right. And there's no doubt in my mind that he took this note to heart and had to have applied it to his son too. Yeah, I, I he, definitely think so. And I feel like that's a chance for him to kind of make right on it. It's like – like Chrissy could have been essentially the do over, I guess, in a sense of like, holy shit, I lashed out, I killed my dad. Uh, you know, like you said, Giuseppe, she dies, like he kills her. It's one of those things where it's like, perhaps this is the first time it really occurs and feels real to him, and he has a chance. And it, part of that probably is because Chrissy's a newborn. Is it's like it's a clean slate, it's fresh. He can essentially. You know, with his with his dad, there's too much already there. It, it, it's hard to change it or, you know, reestablish a different direction for that relationship or, you know, forget the things that have gone on. Um, but with Chrissy, that's a that's a clean slate. You know, he can mold his child and raise him and kind of get that do over and that redeem, you know, that redeeming sense of like, hey, I may have messed it up really bad and made some mistakes. I killed my dad. I, you know killed Giuseppe but it's like with Chrissy he can have his chance to kind of get it right and that you know you know he doesn't get it but uh you know I feel like that's what we're letting believe and definitely with Sally I love I love that I love Sally's character I feel like he is such a good gut check for all those characters because 
he's in prison for something not really mob related per se. No, he is. Oh, it is. I, I'm sorry. He murdered. He murdered. Well, oh, he murdered. He, he murdered a guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. He murdered a made man. That's right. So that's right. it is. It is. Mob I thought I was. I had in my head he had just murdered somebody, but then I remembered it was a made guy. Um, I just think in he is in prison and like he knows that if he goes out, his life isn't better. Like him going, him eventually or ever being freed would arguably worse than being in prison. Yeah. You know, killing a made guy, that ain't anything you come out and that doesn't get forgotten. You know, it's a miracle. He's probably even alive in prison considering the way we see like, you know, people get treated in prison. <laughs> and, yeah. But um, I just think he's, he's got the perspective. He's got that honesty where it's like, yo, I'm not going to sugarcoat shit because look at where I am. Like, look at where I am. Look at what I've done to get here. I know how this shit works. I've come to terms and faced it all because I have nothing to do but sit in here and think about it. You have ever, however, have all this shit you're out there doing. You don't see it. You know, like stop running from that honesty of like, you aren't going to contribute anything positive to Tony's life. Like, at the end of the day, and and here's what I love, is that that message from Sally, whether Sally meant it that way or not, it doesn't have to just be like, oh, you can't bring anything good to his life. It's not even that. If you drop out, like, if you're trying to be positive, it's not going to matter because he knows you're still making money and getting rich and doing all this shit that's not okay, and he's still going to glorify that, that you can't change that. And that's where I think Sally's right is it's like, you just need to be, a you can't be an effect on his life, period. Don't give yourself the chance because he, it's too late. He glorifies it too much already, you know? And I think that's like, what I love about that character is just that honesty is like, he's got that perspective. It, it hits from him, especially considering like for Dickie, that's really all that's left. He killed his dad. So like, this is close to a dad as he can really get. And since you didn't really ever know him, it's like you want to, you know, that perspective probably hits a little bit. It's also it's also great and interesting to me that I get the uh, my interpretation. And I think this is I don't know that this is any anything deep. I really don't think Tony would have fallen into this life if Dickie doesn't die. Man. See, and that's just where I don't know is it's like, God, that's such a, well, and, I mean, and, and hey, time. and hey, no, here's where the thing is like, I can't put it past it because that, that would be very chase. That would be very, Johnny did, Johnny did pretty, Johnny did pretty much the same thing Tony did to AJ. He, he like sheltered did him not him. loop him Tried in. To shelter him he did him, not. Yeah. And he like, he was like, oh, he's going to be a linebacker. You know, like that's, he's going to be the shit. <laughs> like he, he was, he was just a dad about it. Like. And I mean, I mean, his dad was a piece of shit also, but, uh, I think that like he was on that route to be an everyday, to be a civilian as he would have put it in, yeah. in the Sopranos. Like, like he would have, he would have gone on to sell patio furniture or some shit. Mm -hmm. Like he, he would not, I don't like that, that pinky promise there at the end when Dickie's laying in his casket is the pinky promise that, yo. I got this shit, okay? I got this for you. Yeah. I'm going to go and I feel and like, doing it. And yeah, I see what you're saying now. Because like, that's not a message or something Dickie would have said or wanted from him. It wouldn't have been that. But that's Tony only having glorified and looked up to that life that Dickie was leading. And looking up to that, yeah. that he's like, all right. It, he takes, like you said, he takes that into his own hands. He sees that as his responsibility. And, you know... If, it's probably also the moment where he, he's like, I'm a, I'm a look after Chrissy. Yeah. I'm a take over this family. Like I'm a, I'm a do all the shit because I need to prevent what happened to you from happening to anybody else I love. And he just doesn't realize that he can't do that. He can't avoid it, man. I just, I, and now you've got me thinking because it's, I, I this is kind of unrelated, but I was just sitting here and I'm thinking about how, Gosh, it's so crazy. How does, you know, how does Tony find out about who did it, you know? Because obviously he was never told the truth. And oh, if he was? Well, not. Junior would yeah. not. Yeah, no, no. I mean, it's a very clear thing that, like, it's. This, this never yeah, comes out. Nobody right. knows about this. And, like, 
it just goes to show, man, like how sneaky Junior is. And that was evident in the show, I feel like. That was a point that was kind of made. I mean, you look at how he tried to have Tony whacked and like there was essentially no consequence for that. There was like rumble about like Tony would, you know, like there was suspicion, I guess, per se, is how I remember it. But like Junior just goes unchecked and it's fucked up because like the shit he does that goes unchecked shouldn't. But it's also fucked up because if he just acted and did and took some shit into his own hands instead of just trying to be a coward about it. And like, you know, like you said, he could have rose to power multiple different times and, and taken it and claimed it and, 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 you know, sustained it. But instead, he just... He just wasn't that yeah, dude. Like, exactly. it was just never going to be And him. so it's just like one of those things. I think, ah, gosh, you got me thinking. It's just, this, that's what I love about it. It's like when it's a, with this specific movie tied to this specific series, the movie is a standalone film you know it's it's what the sh- what it what you draw from the show and the movie together that i feel like at least for me makes the viewing oh, of this, really get the, makes the viewing of this movie so like ah just good and like makes me like for real we've been talking for an hour and 15 minutes and like i don't even know how much ground of the movie we've really covered i mean we're not necessarily no, yeah, going we've been down talking the line. about the we're not really going, as it relates yeah. to the series but yeah, I, mean, like it's, I just, I, I think like that's what Chase is. That's how you have to like, talk about this movie. Well, and I think that's why, like, I'm so glad I watched it when I did, is because, like, I am not, like, this sounds stupid, but it's not. Like, I am obviously older now and I'm, uh, I've grown smarter. I think a little deeper when I read or watch things or hear, like, listen yeah. to music simply, you know? So it's one of those things where it's like watching this, like I can actually see and like understand some deeper and bigger meanings and and, and things of that nature. And this is just such a good show to watch when you made that click, like that flip, you know, where it's like, oh, hey, like if I would have watched this in high school, this shit's going over my head. And, like, I'm not going to sit here and act high and mighty. Like, I understand all of it. Like, there's probably still things that I could go back and rewatch and draw over my head. But, like, that's what's great. Is like that's a show that doesn't seem exactly rewatchable in nature, but when you think about what you can have missed, it's one that you should probably like eventually circle back to. Like I don't mean like this is that one. This is the kind of show you rewatch, you know, five years after you watched it the first time. Not oh, not yeah. that you, you give this a breath. Yeah, because you want to try to you know, I guess grow. grow. Like, you you want to. That's what be able to draw different things when you watch it the next time for sure. And like, that's what's so, that was what was so cool about watching it at this age Right, is that watching it at this age, we will filter everything through AJ. Exactly what I I was just telling this to somebody the other day is like, when you talk, when you watch Sopranos is it's like, there are things that, you know, David Chase is trying to call to, like he may be showing you this through a mob, like mob family lens. However, this was like, the things that they're dealing with or struggling with maybe from a mob point of view, but that was current. That was real for all families. And that was meant for them yeah, to yeah. relate to just in a, in a stylized sense of the mob. But like you talk yeah, about the was, 2008 was financial crisis, the, you know, you talk about the 2001, uh, the terrorist attacks, nine 11 and stuff. Like we see the impact that has in the show. That was reality for kids growing up. I was one years old. So not necessarily for me, but like, yeah, same, you same. know, you see growing up in that like early mid two thousands through AJ and Meadow. And like, you're like, Whoa, that I was that like, in a sense, that kid during that time. Like, I remember like the effect, like when Tony talks about something that's going on in the current events, I can remember like, Holy shit. Like I remember when I was a kid, my, my parents would sit at dinner and talk or watch the news. Like I remember seeing stuff about this. Like, and that was something that the show was always so good about was yeah. being so culturally relevant right. and talk and being no like, they, making they make that show feel making... so based in reality. It was so current. Uh, and it's, it was it really so current. Is. It was current. It really is at any given in any given point of that series. It is a reflection. It is like a mirror of America at the time. Right. Like, that's and what they talk about they talk about President Bush and terrorism. And it's like, dude, I grew up when all of that was just beginning and starting. And like when that was so prominent and prevalent, you know, like I remember that stuff, you know, you, I was a kid, but like, 
the words war on terror in George Bush's accent, like that is so like locked tight up in here. Like I can literally hear it in my head because I grew up just, you know, around all of that. And it's like, that's like Chase wasn't trying to hide from that. He wanted like families to be able to, in a sense, relate to this, even though they're a mob family. Is it's like, hey, yeah, we are recognizing it. Like we see, you know, like family life in that time. Like that, that was what it was meant to be. You know, right. and I think that's right. like where, like I said, growing up and like watching it, and especially like you said, seeing it from AJ and Meadows lens, like that is a very like it's it's what makes the show great. Because people who were watching it at that time when it was coming out, they were, you know, at Tony's age. They're at Tony's age. They're at, you know, all those characters' age. They're watching it from or even like, Chrissy's. Yeah, yeah, Chrissy's, you know, Adriana, um, all those characters. And it's just cool because like that's what makes that show great, is like our generation can watch it from a lens and it's such a different perspective. It's such a different lens than what, you know, the people who are watching it when it came out. My uncle and I my uncle loves the show. And I've talked to him. Yeah, my before. dad does too. Um, if I talked to him really in depth about stuff and like talked about specific things from the show, I guarantee you we are not going to have some like the same conclusions or perspectives or like you know thinkings on it because like we watched no, it relating and feeling to the different like to completely different characters. You know what I mean? And I just I think that's what's great. And we have strayed away from the movie, but. <laughs> Oh no, I don't give a fuck. I mean, like, there. I, here's my thing: is that there wasn't like a ton to say, it, like, yeah. Just it, well, you have to like, like you it. have to bring in the show, and that's gonna happen. Yeah. yeah. If if we're gonna create, if we're gonna make making a podcast episode, like we did the review, right. we did the twenty minute review up front. This is all the this is all the gory yeah, details. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but I really don't have much else to say. In fact, I got to get going pretty soon. Uh. So I I, w- I was wondering any last thoughts here yeah, on the Mount uh, Saint Yeah, man, I just I really want to talk about the ending just for a second and just think Let's about it. it. It's just seeing, like you said, I mean, we the trailer even like from the first trailer watch, it became so not only told me was drama. right. Well, like when we when we think about the movie, like when we heard the movies coming out and you hear about what it's going to be, Dicky Moltisanti, and we know that's Chrissy's dad. I mean, we're sitting there knowing, hey, what's the big story from the show with Dickie's dad or with Chrissy's dad uh, who shot him and Chrissy going to kill the cop that supposedly shot him. Um, So obviously, when we see Harold McBrayer and he's like, "Eh, I don't know. But then in the trailer, he's definitely painted like from the trailer on from trailer until the last five ten minutes of the movie we are led like exactly like you said to think it is harold mcbrayer that kills dickie and so every time we see harold on screen or you know harold and dickie like about to be doing something that could possibly coincide there's an anxiety on the screen and so when it's junior there is none of that there is a a certain sense of safety i want to say which sounds dumb because Junior's a scumbag, but you know what I mean. Like, you don't oh, yeah, have absolutely. that on your radar. And so when that happens, it's like the shock I felt and, like, just the awe I felt of, like, holy shit. And, like, understanding the implications of not only just Dickie's death, but also now framing everything that happens in the rest of the show. Junior doesn't like Chrissy. Junior does no. not like Chrissy. And it's like, holy shit, it makes so much more sense. Like this awe moment. Well, it's like, there's also a point wow. in season one. There's also a point in season one where Livia literally talks Junior out of whacking Chrissy. And uh, again, you talk about Livia and Dickie. Like there's probably a little bit of that in there. And it's like they're absolutely and see and and one of the big things I've seen about this movie is I've seen people say, well, it just didn't feel like we got enough, like we didn't get enough, and that there's got to be You're enough. People people are enough. saying like, oh, well, the, this this clearly just says that they're gonna make another one that gives us more and more detail going further in, and like and still, I'm like, I don't feel like that at all. I don't see how you watch this either. movie and have that takeaway. I feel like you were given plenty of substance, plenty of things. It's just that you have to piece it and see it with the show. You have to weave those together. And, like, I don't get how if you've been a person that watched the show and claims to love the show, you know how David Chase is about this shit. 
So I don't understand how you could ex- expect to watch the movie and see everything just laid out silver platter and we're going to keep getting stuff more and more. I think what people see- – like those are people wanting this th- these movies to fill all of the time right up until the first episode. That's not Absolutely. that's not going to happen. I don't think we get another one, period. I mean, if we did, great. But, I mean, from what I understood and I've read, I think Chase struggled to find substance and, like, what he was going to do with this movie at first until he kind of got the picture. Okay, I kind of want to focus on the riots. How do I tie this in? Okay, we can seem this together. Yeah. But, like, I don't – you know, you're asking a guy to grab at straws here and make something out of nothing in a sense. Kind of. I think – I think if anything, uh, this this whole thing kind of turned David Chase off to making another movie uh, for HBO. If we got anything, like if we got absolutely anything spinoff wise, like the best I can come up with, and like I don't even really want it right. to be DeMeo crime family related, like with the Sopranos and stuff. I'd like you want to give us a series about Harold McBrayer's new. Thing. Yeah, no. Give, uh, give us that. You want like we can we can stay in the same universe. We can use the same like the same filmmaking style and stuff. We can well, and, write it the way. It's just a new story, you right? Know? Give, like, but it still feels like that Sopranos universe in a sense. And but but like here's the thing, is like I just I I don't want to like I said I just don't get how you watch this movie and that's the takeaway or conclusion you want to come to. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm like I, I I watched it and was like, well that's that's cool. That's it. I I don't yeah. get how yeah. you don't see or feel that sense of finality and like. I mean, I think you hit it really good on the head is like Dickie's death can be a really distinct marker for a lot of shit that happens and what what we see in the show. And so, like, that's just why I think uh, I don't know. I I I liked it. I I think definitely like the show is vitally important. That wasn't going to that's not a shock or that's not a stretch at all by any means. But I feel like talking about it with a friend that's seen it and talking about it and framing it and weaving it with the show makes it seem much more, you know, whole, I guess, or um, just better. It, ma- it makes me feel better about the movie itself. It makes me... Well, and that's the thing, is that, like, it, it is a Sopranos prequel. It, like, you, it is purposeful that you you have to be thinking about the show as you watch the movie. That's just how it works. You have to. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> what happened? I just... Charlie Horst in my hamstring really bad, Ooh, and oh. I was trying to hold it together, but I had to, I had to mute. For I, a I saw you there. muted for a second. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I was gonna like try to let you keep going and holding it, but it's oh no, no, no worries, no worries. <laughs> Uh, I, I again, I don't have much else to yeah, say. No, I know I'm good. I just you. wanted to touch on that ending real quick because you had made a really good point earlier, and I felt like we didn't really totally talk about it, so I wanted to get it. No, I'm uh, for sure. Yeah, I think that, uh, like I said, that that finality of Dickie Moltisanti's story is like the opening for the story we get. Like, right. No, twenty twenty five yeah, years later again. There's, there's like the reason that's what we're getting. Yeah, and I think like what I said, where like I saw a guy I know on Twitter talk about how like he he wants another movie that'll help fill this gap even more, and I'm like, like what you just said. I think Dickie's death kind of does fill the gap in a sense. Like unless you're oh, yeah. unless you're wanting Jackie April type story stuff. I don't know what. Yeah, you, like uh, unless we're going to yeah, talk about yeah. Johnny Soprano's death and stuff. I don't know what else you really get or take from this. You know, I don't know what else there's left really to see. Like, I feel like with what the show gave us and what the movie gave us, that is the, that's the gap. You know, you see a lot of Tony's yeah, formative like, memories. Anything? You see a lot of the things Tony mentions and a lot of the formative memories. You get references to them, or you literally see them. And we yeah. see how all of this stuff has effects on Tony in the in the show eventually, Chrissy. You know, you can make this have effects on a lot of different people. It's really not. You just got to read yeah, into it. Yeah, you got to weave the show with the movie. Exactly. Well, with that, I think I'm I'm gonna leave it. Overall, I loved the movie. Uh, I I I think it's I think it's a really good one. And if if you've seen Sopranos, you have to have seen Sopranos. But watch the movie. It's definitely very, 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 very good. Don't watch it before yeah, the no. series. Yeah, no, and I, I would say, 
I mean, just have a like if you're watching, if you've watched this whole pod or listened to this whole pod before you see the movie. I mean, I would just say like that's what you should push to do is make your own conclusions and weave in the show how you see it. Cuz like that's the thing. The way Chase made that show is not everybody took the same things. Like look at the ending of Sopranos. Nobody fucking agrees on it. So it's like one of those things where, you know, you you can weave in how you see fit, you know? If you yeah. took this away from the show, then don't overthink it, you know? It 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 yeah, exactly. It can fit with this movie. So I just think that's the big thing is like just drawing those conclusions it can make this movie have much more impact. I'm with you 100% and uh yeah, I loved it. Uh well, this was the 138th episode of the Penny Bloom podcast. Twas I Colton Robertson and I was joined by KBZ Kyler Barnett. Thank you very much, buddy. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. It was great to be back. Absolutely, buddy. Uh, It was great to have you. Uh, If you would, head to patreon.com slash co-robloom where you'll find over 18 hours of exclusive content. We got over 25 pieces of uh, exclusive introductions over there. Uh, It's it's, it's a lot of fun. Go to Twitter, follow at PennyBloomPod, follow on Instagram at PennyBloomPodcast. And uh, remember, peace, love, and bloom. And I'm always being accused.